Now we will be hearing from Dr. L.J. Grauke. Dr. Grauke is a curator of the National Collection of Genetic Resources for Pecans and Hickories. The collection is the major germplasm repository for the genus Caria in the United States and is dedicated to the collection, maintenance, evaluation, characterization, and distribution of world genetic resources for that genus. He has made collections of pecans and hickories throughout the United States, as well as in Mexico, Vietnam, and China, developing and maintaining the living collections that compromise the National Collection of Genetic Resources for CARA. He has worked to develop reliable molecular genetic markers to characterize the geographic distribution of genetic diversity across the genus. Grauke, Dr. Grauke is a research horticulturist for the USDARS Pecan Breeding and Genetics Program. The major objective of that program is the development of improved pecan cultivars and rootstocks for all U.S. production areas. He contributed to the release of several pecan cultivars currently in use by the pecan industry. In addition to the routine evaluation of selections under test, research is also conducted for the improvement of selection criteria using standard field observations and molecular genetic techniques. The title of his presentation is Caria, The Next Generation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Grauke. Well, I am delighted to be here. <clears throat> and I told the people when they invited me that I'm a horticulturist, not a geneticist. And I found out in the last couple of days that we actually don't speak the same language. But I will do my best to present the genus Caria. And I'm very proud to be in this crowd. Some guiding concepts as we discuss this. The guiding concept is boundaries. And uh, think about those that concept of boundaries in relation to teams, trees, tests, targets, and time. All of those concepts resonate in relation to Vavilov's life and work. And I think you'll see places where they resonate within the work that I'm going to present. And be aware that these are guiding concepts. That is not a road map. And this will not be a linear progression through those concepts. The first concept of team is that the National Plant Germplasm System is the foundation of the team that I'm part of. The National Plant Germplasm System is managed by USDA ARS. Funding comes from Congress. We've got two projects. The NPGS is a partnership between land-grant universities and ARS and private industries. The USDA ARS designated our program as the National Clonal Germ Germplasm Repository in 1978 and began acquiring the land that, that we moved on to. And the reason they did that is because Louis Romberg, the first pecan breeder, had a, amassed a collection of cultivars that he used in breeding. At the first meetings of the Crop Germplasm Committee in 1984, we had a multidisciplinary group that represented a lot of folks from across the United States working with pecan and USDA. Texas A&M was very well represented by Dr. Story, Dr. Harris, who's an entomologist, many graduate students. Georgia was represented. And Mexico was represented by Ruben Castro and Luis Aguirre. And I was there from LSU Pecan Station. We elected a dynamic strategy of provenance collections, primarily because Bruce Wood had been trained in forestry. And Bruce knew the value of collecting across the range and characterizing diversity in relation to origin. We knew that our primary interest from our industry was in cultivar collections, so we maintained those. But we also wanted to represent the wild species. So we have two projects in our unit. The National Collection of Genetic Resources collects from world species, world sources of genetic diversity. We maintain living collections, because this cannot be stored uh, long term as seed. 
We try to evaluate diversity. We document the accessions, distribute germplasm to appropriate users. And all of that germplasm is used in breeding. So our goal of collecting and conserving in the, in the repository collection is kind of matched in the breeding program in that we're supposed to select and call in a way we're diametrically opposed. We develop improved pecan cyan cultivars and we're charged to understand more about diversity so eventually we can help contribute to rootstock selection. The national collection is given the mandate to represent worldwide sources of wild species to represent genetic diversity. There are 19 species of carrier worldwide. 11 are in the southeastern United States, which is, according to Stephen Manchester, the center of diversity. Six species are found only in Asia, where one may already be extinct. And we have a fairly good collection of those. We're underrepresented in the, in the species. Our distribution of our species includes areas that Vavilov considered his, the, the records that I saw considered Southeast Asia is zone one and uh, Indochina zone two and Mexico zone seven. We've seen different numbers attached to Vavilov's centers of origin but those are definitely represented. Our genus is divided into four, four sections. If you include section Ramphocaria, some people consider it to be this, the genus Animacaria. The pecan hickories are section Apocaria, and they are all diploid, distributed across the southeastern United States. Section caria is the true hickories. They include both diploid and tetraploid members. And section sinocaria is primarily in Asia, or is all in Asia and it only includes diploid members. Section ramphocaria is also in Asia, and I'm not sure what the uh, ploidy level is. Our in our genus, flowering is heterodichogamous, which means that male and female flowers are formed on the same tree, but they mature at different times. And pretandrous cultivars mature male flowers first, protogenous mature female flowers first. That separation of bloom encourages outcrossing. Cultivars are consistent in the bloom pattern from year to year, but uh, Seasons differ, so if you have the same cultivars in, an, in a situation, they often cross in different patterns. Thompson and Romberg described the trait as simple dominant with protogeny being dominant. And Mahan is the only cultivar that we know that is homozygous dominant, so all of its progeny are protogenous. If you look at Clark, it's a pretandrous cultivar and the catkins shed pollen first. You can see that by the dry catkins in the upper left. That's prior to pistillate receptivity. We measure pistillate receptivity by adherence of pollen at the point of when we're checking the stigmas. In the lower group, you see that the protogenous Choctaw has retained pollen on the stigmas and yet it hasn't begun to shed pollen from the catkins. This system encourages cross-pollination, maintains genetic diversity in populations, and we know that cross-pollinated nuts have higher percent kernel, they make bigger nuts, they make more vigorous seedlings, and that gives them an advantage in establishment. So this has implications for forest diversity at the broadest level, and for the selection of cultivars to be used as seed stocks because it impacts vigor in the nursery and it's important in planting orchards for the bloom overlap in order to have an adequate crop. Our species maintain reproductive isolation partially by spatial separation that's due to site adaptation. Native pecan is riverine, a crown, and it occurs along 
our rivers and bottomland sites. Caria aquatica occurs in very poorly drained, frequently flooded sites, and then we have upland species that are on dry xeric sites. So there's a good bit of spatial separation that prevents bloom overlap. We have temporal separation in bloom time. Inception of growth impacts date of bloom, and the last to begin growth and bloom is aquatica, and it often is shedding pollen well after anything else, any other species that it could cross with has been receptive. And what we've seen is that the inception of growth and bloom varies between geographic populations, and there appears to be some uh, isolation even between populations. And then primarily the incompatibility is due to ploidy level. We see that sympatric species on, on the same ploidy level tend to hybridize. If we look at the diploids in section Apicaria, these are the pecan hickories. These species are distributed across the southeastern United States and they overlap in many areas. And they have a disjunct distribution down into Mexico as far south as Oaxaca. Caria palmeri is endemic to Mexico and only occurs in disjunct populations there. Oh, the botanical characteristics or morphological characteristics that we look for in section Apicaria are valvate bud scales. And that seems to be associated with floral pat patterns in that the catkins are formed in opposite pairs at the base of the current season's growth. And that's typical of all of the members of the section Apicaria. When we get into the diploids in section Caria, they have imbricate buds, which means they have overlapping bud scales, and the catkins are formed in the axles of those bud scales. And we have many, many catkins formed at the base of the current season's growth. So it's a totally different structure in the formation of the catkins. Myristicoformis, Liciniosa, and Oveda are the diploid members of section Caria. And in areas where they overlap with, with pecan, they do hybridize. They share, or Myristicoformis and Oveda share a disjunct distribution down into Mexico. The tetraploid members of section Caria are primarily upland species. We don't have the diploids down into Mexico. Like, uh, like the diploids, the tetraploids have imbricate bud scales. I believe they have slightly fewer numbers of scales, but I haven't done extensive work on that. But like the diploids in section Caria, they form their catkins in the axles of the bud scales. And those different morphological characters should be pretty clear when we can associate some of the markers with some of those morpho morphological traits. All tetraploid members of Caria accumulate rare earth elements, and they seem to be more adapted to xeric sites. And in the last month, Bruce Wood has published additional work that indicates that adding the rare earth elements to pollen germination media seems to, some of the, the rare earth elements are agonist and some are antagonist, but they impact germinability and those rare earth elements may impact levels of reproductive isolation. I've collected across the Caria floridana, which has got the most limited distribution of any of the tetraploid species in Florida. And in places, it is sympatric with Caria glabra. In the picture, the tall tree is Caria glabra, and Caria floridana is at about mid-canopy level. Floridana, as a species, has the most dwarfish growth habit, and that trait could be incredibly valuable in pecan if we could incorporate it and have some method of controlling tree size. And when we look at population structure across all of the populations, what we find is that particular geographic populations seem to be characterized by maternal haplotypes that are distinctive within a particular area. 
and where Glabra and Floridana are sympatric, they share those maternal haplotypes, which gives some indication that they may be crossing. And I haven't looked at it in great detail. Section Sinocuria is characterized by naked bud scales, and when the leaves begin to grow, they basically just, this bud scales enlarge into leaflets, and they begin to grow. The catkins can be formed either singly or in pairs at the base of the current season's growth. The th interesting thing about Sinocuria is that the Chinese have described that it is, it has uh, new cell or embryony or apomixis. All of the individuals that we've examined with our limited microsatellites have exactly the same genetic profile, and yet they're grown from seed collected decades apart. They have the same identity that I only see in pecan if I'm looking at exactly the same grafted cultivar. The Asian species tend to be found in isolated populations, and we don't see much overlap between the species. When Dabishonensis was first described, I doubted that it really was a species. I figured it was just a population of Caryocathiensis. They were naming it based on isozyme patterns of difference, and we saw huge differences in isozymes across pecans. And yet, uh, we do see different patterns in the haplotype, or in the, yeah, the, all of the molecular profiles that I've run of Dabishonensis versus Cathiensis. We've done some preliminary work characterizing kernels, and they're distinctive there. Pecan is our target for breeding. It's the most economically valuable member of the genus, and it's what we've been working with for a long time. As you see in the picture, one of its traits is it makes a big tree. It's a native species, so it has co-evolved pests. It's broadly distributed. It has regional adaptations. Like I said, it's very large to 44 meters, long-lived over 200 years, slow to bear. We, 12 years is common. It's outcrossing. As we've talked, it has wind pollinated. There's inbreeding depression. Graph propagation only began in 1846. So there are trees in the forest that are older than the industry. There are immortal cultivars. Once they're propagated, they can be maintained and passed down. And things that work tend to be maintained in regional industries. We see tremendous site effects to the performance of trees. There are rootstock effects that we can detect in terms of nutrient uptake and patterns of phenology. We have a fragmented industry that's fragmented by region in that we have different cultivars grown in different areas. We have a fragmented industry in that the shellers that often market the crop are kind of antagonistic to the growers who are producing the crop and vice versa. We have a fragmented research community in that we tend to be divided into states and we have increasing intellectual property issues that tend to isolate us. Apart from that, no problems. <laughs> so these large-lived, long-lived trees ultimately show the integrated cumulative effects of their genetics and if they're grafted, that includes both the rootstock and the scion. They show the effect of the environment, the climate, the soils, and the biotic factors. And they show the impact of the culture, the irrigation, fertility, and pest control. And getting all of those things into test systems and then monitoring those tests over time obviously complicates the kind of work that you can do with colleagues across the range. Our cultivar collection includes individuals that represent the most anxious, ancient materials for our industry. Centennial was the first cultivar propagated by the slave Antoine in 1846 at the Oak Alley Plantation in Louisiana. The tree was still living in 1902 when William Taylor took that picture. 
and in the yearbook of agriculture they published drawings. Our passport information to our accession of Centennial is good and it matches morphologically, but we had hoped, I had hoped to get simple molecular markers that would give me confirmation of identity and so by establishing molecular profiles of verified collections it gives us the ability to verify identity, link that with phenotypic information that we've developed over time and it gives us a rich picture of an, a native industry that's still in development. Our pecan cultivar collection now has over 350 grafted accessions and we maintain them at two work sites in College Station and in Brownwood, Texas, which was the home of the breeding program. Most of our accessions have been verified by the combination of the techniques of origination from trustworthy sources, morphological verification based on known nut patterns. Isozyme profiles were the first methods that we used for any type of molecular effort and in that process we found that cultivars that we had released as control crosses were inconsistent with the patterns that we found in isozymes and so we disqualified Kiowa as um, Mayhan by Odom and found that it was consistent with Mayhan by Desirable. Our molecular markers developing since then have confirmed that. So anything we do in pecan that gives us a, a foundation in molecular identity has been trustworthy and, and those have been linked to specific inventories. We try to build our development of microsatellite markers on the ones that we had already identified with the isozyme. So what we're trying to do is stack on top of an individual inventory its verification. And then as pictures and other information on phenotype are accumulated in relation to that in inventory, we have a level of verification that we think is valuable. It's a museum grade verification. And our molecular profiles are obviously linked to individual inventories. We monitor our trees seasonally for patterns of bud break flowering, nut maturation, and, and we have nut quality and patterns of disease expression. There have been 29 cultivars that we've released in the USDA pecan breeding program. The first one was named Barton after a man that owned the orchard that Louis Romberg worked with. After that time they've all been given the names of American Indian tribes in honor of the stewards of the forest. The first releases were known for high nut quality and increased production, prolificacy and precocity, and they alternate bear horribly and many of them were very badly disease susceptible. In 1984, Tommy Thompson released Pawnee and that inaugurated early nut maturation, early harvest, and that has altered management. It's given us a premium for the market and it's considered critical in the southeastern part of the market and it has contributed to the, you know, the Chinese market right now is buying a huge part of our crop and they love early harvest. Wichita is a cultivar that was developed for the West, shows the highest sustained yields and it's used extensively in New Mexico and West. Lakota and Kansas have act excellent scab resistance. Just to give you an overview of the mechanical process of making crosses, I don't know if you can see it, but in the canopy there are some little white dots and those are actually viscous sausage casing that's already, I've wrapped it over the tips of the female flowers prior to their receptivity. So by blocking the wind-blown pollen from a stigmatic surface that hasn't come into receptivity, we're protecting it so that when we go in later and apply pollen, we know that we've got a control cross. Later we go up into the tops of the male tree that we've selected to be the parent, collect catkins, dehiss the pollen, put it into a fancy bulb syringe like you might use on your car radiator, and stick a syringe into the base of the viscous sausage casing and put in a puff of pollen to pollinize the cluster. So you're working in the top of a lift, moving around a canopy, trying to make crosses. 
Tommy Thompson didn't like to make more than one pollen introduction into a particular female canopy because it complicates the process of either making the cross and harvesting and maintaining the uh, materials. I was a little more daring and I, I take sometimes as many as 13 pollens into the canopy and, and have done tests like that. And uh, it's an ugly business, but it's really a beautiful time to be out in the tops of trees. These are pictures of some of the cultivars and some of the information about them just to give you an idea of how we record the voucher specimens that represent a cultivar and it's inventory specific and then we'll have nut measures that are associated with those photographs. This was released in 1959 from a cross made in 1940, Halbert by Mahan. This is very susceptible to scab in fact, even in central Texas, it's very, very badly damaged and has to be protected by multiple fungicide sprays, prophylactic multi, uh, fungicide sprays. It's a standard in the West, and, and yet it's got some limitations even in the West under arid conditions. Pawnee, as I said, Tommy released for early nut maturation, and it's a revolutionary cultivar. It's being commonly used even in Georgia now, it's overtaking desirable as a commonly planted cultivar according to Lenny Wells in, 19, in uh, 2014. It is susceptible to pecan scab, but the disease can be controlled by fungicide applications. Seems to have outstanding resistance to yellow aphids. Nuts mature mid-September here, and uh, it has some unusual patterns of kernel quality that limited, but in general, it's an excellent cultivar. Kanza is major by Shoshone, and it was released in 1996 from a cross made in 1955. That's a long time. It has excellent disease resistance, smaller nuts than most people want to grow for the commercial industry, but uh, it's finding a place even in the southeast because of its disease resistance. Lakota is another cross that includes major. It's Mayhan by major and a cross made in 1964 and wasn't released until 2007. It is very resistant to pecan scab disease, has pretty good nut quality, and uh, is being doing well in the northern pecan production area. This table is too busy to study in great detail, but if you look on the far right, you see the average number of years from the time a cross was made until it was released by the three major pecan breeders we've had. Louis Romberg took an average of 20.8 years from the time he crossed until the release was made. Got a little worse under George Madden, 26.2. And I have Thompson's name there, but Grauke worked with Thompson on everything except Pawnee. So I'm to blame there too, and 35 years is our average. That's a long time. Can we do better? We had hoped that we might be able to develop techniques that would help us select materials and release them that would not only be a faster turnaround time, but we need to be selecting materials for something other than just a single trait, not just a big nut, not just early nut maturation. Fly is the foundation parent for the improved industry. 20 of our 29 cultivars trace back to Schley, and both Pawnee and Wichita descend from Schley. University of Georgia has recently patented four progeny of Wichita by Pawnee, and if you remember, both Wichita and Pawnee are very disease susceptible. And in our orchards, we've evaluated literally thousands of that cross, and we've never found anything that we trusted to release because it was all too susceptible to scab. And in our orchards, when we evaluate one of their Wichita by Pawnee crosses, it is among the most scab susceptible of the materials that we have. And they're making up to 15 fungicide applications a season to protect it from scab. Can we use genetic resistance to develop cultivars that might not rely on fungicide applications at that level? This is a picture of the yield and value of the pecan industry over the last 
50 years on using a 10-year running average. If we did actual yields, what you would see is alternate bearing makes this look like, you know, it's, it's just a mess. But what you can see in this is that there have been some upticks and there's been some plateaus. There's been a recent uprise in the improved pecans, huge increase in value of the improved pecans. While the native pecans are decreasing in yield as they slightly increase in value, I'm concerned that we have ignored the native resource and we need to represent it. I'm very grateful that we took a, a strategy of representing the native pecans in pecan provenance tests. At the first meetings of our crop germplasm committee, Ruben Castro of Cona Fruit in Mexico shared information about the distribution of the Mexican pecans, and those were within Vavilov's Zone 7, which he considered to be a very rich area for genetic diversity. We made collections of native populations across the United States in 86 and across Mexico in 87. We attempted to get at least 100 nuts from each of five mother trees separated by at least 200 meters, and it's variable how well we succeeded with that. The, in, we collected nuts to represent 94 trees, 94 mother trees. They represent 19 native populations distributed from Missouri to Oaxaca. Bruce Wood was working with USDA at the time we made those collections, and he planted the best collection in Byron, Georgia. I came to ARS in 1988, and the first thing I did was try to make a planting, but I didn't have much to work with, and my populations are not as good as Bruce's. Over time, one, this, I'm going to show you some pictures from uh, two years of data where we collected leaf samples from each tree in Byron and College Station. These are mid-leaflets from the mid-leaf of the current season's growth. Bruce sent me the leaves, and I ran them through a leaf area meter, dried them, you know, weighed them, dried them, and got water weight, and then we analyzed them. And what we see is that leaflet area increases from the east to the west in both of our provenance orchards. That increase in leaflet area seems to be associated with leaflet water. And leaflet density is greatest in the west, decreases to the east. And so it's possible that that's an adaptation to a dry climate. If we look at geographic patterns of disease resistance, the uh, guys in Byron rated all of their trees in 1998 under uh, Chuck Riley. And here recently, Clive Bach went back in for a couple of seasons and monitored disease resistance and analyzed it. And what he found is that the northern materials tend to have the greatest resistance. And in the west and south, we have pretty good susceptibility. I have another provenance orchard that was kind of a serendipity deal. In 1994, Tommy judged a native pecan show in Mexico and asked them if he could have the entries. So instead of going laboriously across populations in Mexico, we just took these nuts that they had collected. They had the entry level information. We planted them out in a greenhouse. I planted seed from some of our uh, native trees representing uh, more northern United States seed as control. Planted an orchard in 1997 that represents 1,400 trees and put it into eight blocks. Those blocks go across a site that's on a Westwood silty clay loam down to a ship's clay. Eight, six blocks in the Westwood, two in the ship's clay. If you look at it from the air, you can see that the ship's clay in the lower corner, the trees are smaller and you can see gaps between them. As I said, you know, these trees are going to show the accumulated effect of the site and the management and the genetics over time. I analyzed these data in relation to the corridor of latitude where the mama tree came from. It's a grossly unbalanced test. So from the south to the north, if you look, you see the N numbers there. The second, our orchard is located in, in the third latitude corridor. And uh, so the very southern Mexican materials 
are the ones that where we have the most representation in this orchard. This is just looking at patterns of tree growth as a function of their site. And sure enough, that ship's clay really kind of reduces the growth of the trees. And block seven is intermediate, and the trees are smaller there than they are in the rest of the blocks. If we look at the pattern of tree growth in relation to the origin, the southernmost materials are, are reduced as compared to our zone three. The center block is where our orchard is located. But if we collected a little bit south of our location, the trees are larger. And that's measuring both the diameter of the trunk, the height of the tree, and the canopy width. And as you go north, we get into reduced tree size. So if we wanted to control tree size, does it matter that the northern materials seem to be producing trees that are of smaller diameter, shorter, and less canopy width? If we look at initiation of growth, it occurs first in seedlings from southern sources, and that's consistent with what we see in the other provenance orchard that we share with Byron. And as we go north, we get later seasons of bud growth. And leaf scab also is decreased to the north and increased to the far south. Interestingly, if we get some defoliation during the year, we'll get a late season refoliation, and that tends to occur on the southern materials, but it doesn't occur on the northern materials. The southern materials tend to be indeterminate in growth, and that exposes them to a liability for a late freeze or an early freeze in the autumn. So there are some phenological liabilities that we see that are a direct function of the zone of origin of the seed from the mama. We wanted to develop even primitive markers that we could use to verify identity. And so my goal was to have markers that would help me identify cultivar. I had hoped that I would be able to have resolution to identify species and potentially geographic populations. I wanted to verify parentage, and we developed a few of the universal plastid uh, markers, and they are informative for the direction of cross. They've been very helpful. In the breeding program, we eventually want to be able to associate phenotype with genotype, and we'd like to understand adaptation. We'd like to be able to pro eventually provide genetic markers for selection. By having a group of scientists work on this together, it gives us a common platform that we think that we can share, and that gives us a common entree into a genetic base that we may go in different directions for selection, but at least we're working together. And the first goal is to work together to develop the tools to characterize the foundations of diversity. When we looked at our plastid markers, they're very informative looking at geographic populations. When we looked at our nuclear markers, they weren't nearly as informative. And what that tells me is that I would like to have SNPs that are associated with with uh, plastids. When we take our three plastid and 11 nuclear microsatellites in binary form and look at the sections, we got 325 loci looking at 418 samples divided into five populations, and these are de described in relation to sections with one rhizocarion as a juglans section that we threw in just as kind of a, an outlier. Apocaria species are considered apocaria, even if it's a hybrid between like pecan and water hickory. Since those are two apocaria species, I still call those apocaria. But if it's a hybrid between caria section and apocaria, like a cross between oveda and pecan, then those are hybrids. And when we do a principal coordinate analysis, what you see is that the Blue triangles are apocaria. The red squares are caria. They separate clearly. The hybrids tend to be intermediate. There are many intermediate individuals that may be introgressing at levels that we didn't identify them as hybrids. We know that we have pollination or cross pollinations between those. It's interesting that sinocaria is farther removed from the two 
North American sections than even rhizocarion, the juglans, and that is interesting. We had hoped that we could work with our juglans buddies to develop markers, but truth is all of juglans is in California and they've got an industry and a support that we can't buy into. If we look at the species and do a principal coordinate analysis, what we see is that over on the far right, lower, you've got Dobishinensis and Cathiensis, and they're more widely separated as species than even the U.S. pecan and Mexican pecan across all of the range of our U.S. Uh, species. Tip, you know, what we're seeing is that the only outlier is that Myristicoformis is grouping with Apocaria, and uh, Myristicoformis has actually been put into different sections by different botanists over time, and it's interesting. And uh, the hybrids between Pecan and, the, and uh, Oveda and Nusbalmeri tend to clump with section carrier. What we would like to do is make sure that we form cores that represent the kinds of variability we're seeing. In our first effort at making a core collection, we did it on the basis of isozymes, and basically I did it by the seat of my pants, and it was, nobody cared about it. Nobody wanted the core that I put together because who's going to propagate a bunch of cultivars just to see that kind of diversity? If we form a core now and we have tools to work with it, I think we can be asking questions in relation to populations that have good phenotypic information and things may be different. In the process of working with these markers, we've seen things like major, which has contributed much in our breeding program, appears to be an interspecific hybrid. If you look at the lower green portion of that table, those are cordiformis, the bitternut hickory. All of those have uh, alleles of 115 in a uh, pentanucleotide locus that was formed from uh, some work in conjunction with the Klein lab and the Grusak lab. Pecan at the top of that table is typically in 155 to 165 base pair alleles. All of the known hybrids between pecan and cordiformis have one 115 allele and one larger allele to represent the pecan. And major has that hybrid type pattern, and so do its progeny. It's possible that major is actually not just cordiformis by pecan. It could be that it's Oveda cordiformis hybrid, which is Caria excellenae. As we get more markers, we're going to be able to understand more about the introgression of the genes from the wild relatives. The question is, does the valuable disease resistance that we see in major come from that introgression of genes? We ought to be able to see that if we have good phenotypic information and good molecular markers. If we look at the geographic origin of our pecans, even using these incredibly simple microsatellite tools. What we've done here is I've divided into geographic regions, and the geographic regions are shown in this map. So you can see the SW and SC are in Mexico. CW is the western central region. And the main thing to look at is the north, central, and northeast in relation to the central east. The central east we think of as the disease resistance. When we do this principal coordinate analysis, the northern materials clump and are separate very clearly from two other groups. This may not mean much to you guys that are gene jockeys, but I'm always impressed that I see any segregation at all with simple tools. And I'm hoping that with better tools, we'll have better information. When we take all of these and we look at affinities, these are populations of origin on both the upper and the other and the right axis. And so where we have the greatest affinity, you'll have a green marker. And typically that's where you're looking at the population intersecting with itself. It's most like itself than it is from other populations. That bright 
yellow in the middle with the lowest number on the table is where the Oaxaca population meets itself. So the lowest diversity in any individual population that we found was in Oaxaca. And then the orange marks are where we have the greatest genetic distance for any population. And it's interesting that the Ixmiquilpan population, Mexico 4, has the greatest distance from almost every other population that we looked at. It turns out that I had done some profiles across Bruce's collection as well as ours, and the only individual that I found that was homozygous at all 11 nuclear microsatellite loci came out of that Oaxaca population, and it's possibly due to topographic isolation and inbreeding. But since it's hard to get an inbred in pecan because of inbreeding depression, we'll take what we can get. And what we thought we would do is see if that would be an appropriate reference genome. I talked to Bob Klein one day, and he recommended that I talk to the guys at Hudson Alpha. He knew Jeremy Schmutz, and he said, if you can trick these guys into doing some sequencing, it would be helpful. We didn't have a community to come together to do molecular profiling, but he said that, you know, maybe we could do something. So I called up Jeremy Schmutz, and, and Jeremy Schmutz is an amazing guy. You probably know him, but he's curious, and he just he asked questions, and we talked, and we talked about what might work, and I told him about the Oaxaca individual, and I said, in the breeding program, Pawnee is the big deal, but Pawnee is a cross between Mohawk and Star King, and Mohawk is an eastern, and Star King is a northern, so I would think that they might have more heterozygosity. And so he took Pawnee and our Oaxaca individual and ran some, did some of his magic on it. And Hudson Alpha came back with the statement that it looked like that, that would, the Oaxaca individual would be a good one to do a, a reference genome on. And that's been good because with just a little bit of sequence information, what's happening is people are starting to use these tools and align things to them, and we're starting to see the, build, the building of annotation databases. I've looked at this. This is the, the Mexico 4 population out of Ixmiquilpan that we said is most distant from others, and uh, it has a pattern of growth that's way radically different than anything we've seen. It has a weeping growth habit, but it also is incredibly vigorous, and when we've included it in tests for salinity trials, it makes the biggest seedlings, and they seem to tolerate both sodium and chloride. And when we've used it in cotton root rot trials in Uvalde, it makes by far the largest individuals in the seedlings test. Is that due to heterosis? We don't know, but it has phenological patterns of liability because it breaks bud too early. It may be subject to freezes if we deploy it in the wrong area. We're going to have to trick somebody into testing it in field trials for salinity better than we've been able to test it. But these are other individuals in that Ixmiquilpan population, and they share that same unusual growth pattern, while trees out of other neighboring Mexican populations have a much larger upright tree growth. We've never tried to select for patterns of tree size or shape. We don't have descriptors to describe those things. We need to develop them. We need to be looking at patterns of tree architecture because if we can devise a way to select for materials that maintain tree size, we could change the pecan industry. We have individuals that are hybrids between our wild relatives this is, I inherited this tree without any information. It was just called Jones hybrid hickory. I think that it's a Cordiformis bioveda, which is an interspecific hybrid known as Curia excellentae. Um, and looking at the historic information, I think that it's actually was named as Sears, and the person that named it thought that it was a Tomentosa by Bitternut. But the tree form is outstandingly columnar and has the kind of pattern that people predict would do well in orchards. Can we integrate that into pecan and make selections? Dave Stelly helped us look at some of the pollen patterns, and we have potentially unreduced gametes that might 
possibly fertilize tetraploids. There are strategies that we ought to be able to work with that hopefully will contribute. So there are windows of opportunity for the next generation. If you were here yesterday, you heard Nolan talk about genome by sequencing. We're tricking some young students to get involved with pecan, and that's great. And they will take us to places that I can't imagine. And at the same time, we have challenges that we need to be careful with. In the back of the room is young Key Joe. He's got a graduate student, Angeline Hilton. We've been working with Zalila fastidiosa. We're seeing patterns of a bacterial challenge in our pecans, and we're trying to characterize it. That limits our ability to distribute germplasm. And we need to be characterizing what is present in pecan and understand what is pathological or what may just be present. To do that, we're going to have to characterize biomes at levels that we haven't done. We need to be looking at associations between organisms across ranges. And we can be doing that as we develop improved methods. In doing this, we're going to need to do the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. If we release a seed stock that has phenological liabilities that kill orchards in the first season of a bad freeze, then we've done harm. How do we test things so that we know that they can contribute? Those are going to be challenges. And if we can work together as a small group of researchers, we'll do a better job than if we work in isolated pockets. And typically what's happening is this, we're segregating. We need to come together. And these tools will help us come together. We have a germplasm base that is a good place to work. So I think that um, those will be good foundations for the next generation of scientists and the next generation of trees. And that's, I've worked with good people over time. And that's, that's a partial listing. And I probably will not be able to hear your questions. And if I hear them, I may not be able to answer them. But I'm through. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Grocky, for your presentation. We have time for just one question. Thank you. So, any questions? Uh, thank you, Dr. Grocky. Uh, just based on the uh, history of, you know, pathogens with uh, long living tree species like the chestnut and now the laurel wilt affecting the avocados in Florida and things like that. Do you see there being an issue with that occurring in the pecan germplasm in America where we could possibly lose all of it due to an invasive species coming in? Or do you think there's the resistance somewhere that we just don't have the tools to capture it yet? Resistance to? Just like a devastating foreign pathogen that would come in because it's a new host that can transfer it. There are diseases that are being described that are seed borne in, in Carrier, in China, a virus that's recently been described. And what my feeling is, is that we should be very careful about exchange of germplasm in general. There are things that we don't know and in this country, we don't need the exotic germplasm to do a good job of breeding and development. I don't want to limit the distribution of germplasm, and yet I also don't want to inflict a disease on another country that could devastate, if not, you know, carrier, it might devastate other species that it jumps to. And that's what's happening with Zalala fastidiosa in Europe. So I think that there are some phytosanitary issues that we need to be careful about. And I think that if we do a good job of developing genomic tools, we can understand what we need to do with strategic distributions that can, can meet everybody's need. And we have a wonderful group of scientists who are developing tissue culture for pecan for the first time. Jennifer Randall in New Mexico is developing tissue culture methods. When I was a graduate student, many people were working on tissue culture, and I was afraid of it because I was afraid we would 
deploy monocultures under the ground before we understood the genetic diversity and the distribution of that adaptations. But I see Jennifer developing tools that are going to give us insight into adaptation at levels that we can't do in the fields and in shorter periods of time. I think that as we develop better tools, the next generation of scientists is going to work very aggressively within existing populations of diversity and we'll do a better job. And in the process, we'll protect our foreign colleagues as we meet their needs for diversity from this beautiful North American genus. That answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grafke. It is now time for our student research poster competition.